Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis 50, chapter 50, and Matthew 6. All right, so open the Genesis 50 and then put a marker at Matthew chapter 6. So this week is the pardon test. I want you to remember that Joseph's brothers sold him as a slave when he was a teenager. Could you forgive your own brothers for selling you, and they were going to kill him. They were going to kill him. For selling you as a slave, as far as Joseph knew, for the rest of his life in the slavery as a teenager. And so in Genesis chapter 50, I want us to read it carefully. I, I almost wanted to tell you what I'm going to talk about a little bit later in this message so you'd see it when we read it. So just read it very carefully with me uh, and see if you see something in here as we read this. All right, Genesis 50 verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, when his brothers saw their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, before your father died, he commanded, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. I hope you remember that because we're going to come back to their exact wording. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. I believe he wept because he was hearing his father died. He didn't know that. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now, the only way he could have spoken kindly to them was if he had already dealt with this issue in his heart. And I think he dealt with it. This is the first time the, the word forgive is in the Bible. You just read it. It's not in the first 49 chapters of the Bible. It's in Genesis 50 for the first time. It means to absolve fully or to release from penalty. It also means, though, and most of the time when this Hebrew word is translated, it's translated actually this other meaning, to lift up or to bear. And that is exactly what Jesus did for us. He lifted off our sin, our transgression off of us. He bore it himself, thereby releasing us from the penalty and absolving us fully. So how in the world can we do this? Please hear me. I, I know I've said this every test. I know that. But if you don't pass this test, you can't fulfill your destiny. If you can't learn to pardon people or forgive people, you will not fulfill the destiny God has for your life. And I believe that God's given me a key to learning how to do it. Because so many people say, well, I try, but it's so hard, Pastor, because you don't understand what was done to me. I understand sometimes it is hard to forgive people for a, for a, 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 har a, a tremendous wrong or harm that they've done to us. But I really believe I have a key to doing that. And I'm going to give you three words to remember, all right? So here's the first one. Number one, release. Release. That's what it means. Now, let me show you something I told you I wanted you to remember. When Joseph's brothers saw that his father had died, they said, perhaps Joseph will be angry with us, hate us, and repay us for the evil we did. So they sent messengers to him saying, now we're going to get in that a little more, but listen very carefully to me. I believe with all of my heart that this was a lie. We have no record in the Bible of Jacob saying this on his deathbed. What we had that we just read was when Joseph saw that Jacob, their father, had died, they said, okay, he's already dead. And they concocted this plan. And they sent messengers 
saying, listen to their wording, your father commanded, not asked. See, I see them coming up with this saying, oh, no, no, don't say your father asked, say your father commanded. Your father commanded, saying, please forgive your brothers. They did evil. And, and, and then it says this. It's just so amazing to me that they even said this. Uh, then it said, um, before your father died. Okay, it's like, Joseph, uh, this is his dying wish. Please forgive the servants of your God. Let, let's put God in there. Put God in there. They worked on this message completely. By the way, it says, for they did evil to you. Now, here's what gets me. There was never a we. We did evil. If you notice, the brothers never repented. They never said we did or we asked. They, when they came and met with him, they said, we are your servants. Well, that was obvious. That's not repentance. We understand that you have authority. We understand that. Well, that's not repentance. They never said, we did this. Okay, I want to ask you something. Can you forgive someone who lies and manipulates and never asks for forgiveness? That's the pardon test. And if you don't forgive, here's what Joseph said. He said, am I in the place of God? Listen carefully. If you don't forgive, you put yourself in the place of God. This is why the Bible says, Leviticus 19, 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then Romans 12, 19 in the New Living Translation says, Dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God. For it is written, I will take vengeance. I will repay those who deserve it, says the Lord. Now let me tell you why we are commanded not to take vengeance. Because the word vengeance means to bring justice to an unjust situation. That's what it means, to bring justice to an unjust situation. Now, let me tell you why God tells us not to take vengeance, because it is impossible for us to do that. We cannot bring justice to an unjust situation. Let me, let me tell you why, because we're not just. And some of you might think, no, no, yes, we are. No, 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 no. There's a big difference in being just and being justified. <laughs> We've been made justified by the only one just. The Bible says God's the only one just. So we can't bring vengeance. And here's what happens. If you live your life with unforgiveness, you will always be trying to avenge yourself. You'll always be trying to vindicate your, yourself. And you'll always be looking in every situation you'll want to say, did you see that? Did you see what I did there? And you'll spend your life trying to prove something, listen carefully, rather than please someone. Let me say it another way. I have nothing to prove. I have someone to please. And that's what vengeance does. Now listen to me. If you're going through it in your mind, listen, I don't care what you tell me with your mouth, you haven't forgiven. Because God is not going through your sins in his mind. You haven't forgiven. And that is where it brings us to the next word, is receive. The, now, the first word is release. The second word, receive. Matthew 6, this is, and if you may, you may have turned to it, the Lord's Prayer, we call it. And forgive us, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, here, I've got some bad news for you, all right? You've prayed this prayer. How many of you, all the camp says, how many of you have ever prayed the Lord's Prayer at some point? Can I see your hand? Okay. The word as means in the same way. Here's what you prayed. Lord, forgive me in the same way I forgive others. That would have been helpful information before you prayed that prayer, wouldn't it? <laughs> You've been asking God to forgive you. Lord, will you forgive me the same way that I forgive other people? Now, let me explain this to you. This is the way we're to forgive. We're to forgive in the same way. So if you keep bringing it up, you haven't forgiven in the same way God's forgiven you. Because God doesn't keep bringing it up. And here's the way that we actually forgive. The Bible says freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, freely give. All right, think about this. We have freely received forgiveness. Therefore, we can freely give forgiveness. Now, listen to me very carefully, though. If you have a problem 
forgiving people, it's actually because you have a problem receiving forgiveness. If you feel in any way that you are paying for your sins or earning forgiveness, you will make others pay for what they do and you'll make others earn your forgiveness. It's very important. Listen, many believers, many believers live with a hit me mentality. A hit me mentality. And this is the way we feel. Something bad happens to us and we think, yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, I knew when I only had $500 left for another week that I shouldn't have bought a $400 barbecue grill. Now I can't pay this other bill that came in. And yes, thank you, Lord. You're getting me back. Now we're even. No, it, it's, just, it's just math. You don't spend 400 when you only got 500 left for another. We just, it's just, but it's not God getting you back. But that's the way we feel. Or, or we have a flat tire. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, I knew I did not have my quiet time this morning. I got up late. And so now you're teaching me. You're getting me back for not having my, oh, and now it's starting to rain. That's a nice touch, Lord. That's a nice touch. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You've gotten me back. And here's the way we feel. Now, we're even. We look at every bad thing in our life as God getting even with us. Now, listen to me very carefully. Listen. God is never going to get even with you because he already got even with Jesus. You have to hear that. Don't live with this, hit me, but here's the problem. Listen, if you have that tendency at all, then you have a difficulty receiving forgiveness. And if you have a difficulty receiving forgiveness, you have a difficulty giving forgiveness. So, as I went through this message, I thought, well, how can I help? If someone has a difficulty receiving forgiveness, how can I help? And here's the third word, believe. Believe. Now, I'm going to read you some scripture, and then I'm going to tie it together. All right? So just stay with me on these, all right? Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. By the way, that would be that he obliterated them. Because that's infinity. Okay? Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, lifted off of us and laid on him, the iniquity of us all. Now, I'm going to read a few more, but just two questions so we make sure we get that. How far has God removed our iniquity from us? How far does it say, literally? From the east to the west, right? And what did he do with the iniquity of us all? Laid it on Jesus, right? All right, let me say it one more time. I want everyone to answer, all right? How far has God removed our iniquity from us? And what did he do with the iniquity of us all? Okay, remember those two, all right? Let me read you just a few more. Habakkuk 1.13. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil. This is the same word for sin. And cannot look on wickedness. Or, that, pardon me, that's the word for sin. You can't look on wickedness. You can't look on sin. Your eyes are too pure. Now, Job 36, 7 says, he does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous. So he can't look on wickedness, evil, or sin, but he never withdraws his eyes. Never, ever, ever does he take his eyes off the righteous. 1 Peter three twelve. for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open to the prayers. Now, God can't look on wickedness. He can't look on sin. But he never withdraws his eyes from the righteous. Okay, you know what I think about that? I think, well, I wish I was righteous. Sure wish I was righteous. According to this, God can't even look at me. But he, he never takes his eyes off the righteous. Okay, let me read you one more scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin 
for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, listen to me very carefully. We were born sinful. So sinful. God is so pure, he can't even look at sin. But his eyes are on the righteous every day. So God took all of my sin. He lifted it off of me. <laughs> he bore it himself. That I could become the righteousness of God. And now his eyes are on the righteous every day. You have to hear this. Something had to be done with your sin just so God could look at you. Just so he could look at you. But he did such a wonderful job laying my iniquity on his son and removing it from me as far as the east is from the west. Not only can he look at me, he can walk with me, he can talk with me, he can put his arm around me, and he can have a relationship with me. He has completely, totally removed my sin from me. Because I believe that, because I really understand that, I can forgive you. <laughs> because I've received that forgiveness fully and freely. Fully and freely. I can give you full and free forgiveness. I have a friend of mine, and he's really not a pastor. He's a rabbi. He's a messianic rabbi. And he leads the congregation in North Dallas called Baruch Hashem. We sowed into that congregation uh, when they were building their building. They built the largest building for a Messianic congregation in the world. And we helped them build that building. Uh, his name is Marty Waldman. I was having lunch with him one time and I said, Marty, tell me your story. I'd like to hear your story. He said, well, my grandparents were in Auschwitz. And one day, my grandparents, on both sides, father and mother side, with some other men and women, gathered together about 20 young people, teenagers, and said, we don't think we're going to make it out of here. You guys need to make a, try to escape, because we're not going to make it. And they took Marty's mother, who was then a teenager, long before Marty was born, she wasn't even married at the time, just a teenage girl, and they sewed money in her coat. And this money was for all of them. And they, one night, they took off running. Well, the guards opened fire, and they shot Marty's mother's sister. She ran back, and Marty's mother's sister died in her arms. And while she was trying to save her sister's life, she was shot in both legs. Two of the boys came back out of the woods then and drug her to safety. They took her to a German family, and because she was wounded and could not run, couldn't get away, and because she had money in her coat, they said, we don't want any of it. We'll give it all to this family if you guys will take care of her. And they agreed to take care of her. And they nursed her back to health and raised her as their own daughter. That's how she survived the war, war Marty's mother. Marty's father, who was also in that group and already had, had seen Marty's mother and was attracted to her, you know, he then, with about ten of the guys, they went into the woods and they dug a pit and they lived in the pit for over a year. And they would come out at night and go into this town to forage for food, but during the day they had to stay in the pit. After about a year, they were discovered, and the Nazi soldiers came and said, come out of the pit or we're going to kill all of you. And so they came out of the pit, they took them back to a prison camp, and the commandant came out and said, are any of you boys a tailor? And Marty's father was a tailor. And he said, I'm a tailor. They said, we need someone to fix our uniforms. You come over here. And they lined the rest of the boys up, and his father realized that he, they were about to kill him. And he said, wait, I need an assistant. Just trying to save at least one more. And he said, then choose one more. And there were two brothers that were his best friends. He had to choose which one lived and which one died. He chose one of the brothers. And those two then took care of their, soul, their uniforms. Then when the Russians were coming, at the end of the war, the Germans were going to take off. They said, go get our horses ready. Marty and this young man, Marty's father and this young man, realize they're going to kill us.
before they leave. They're going to leave any of them alive as witnesses. So they just got on two of the horses and rode toward the Russians. And the German soldiers did kill every, every Jew that was in the camp before they left the camp. And that's how Marty's father's life was spared. And when the war ended, he went all over Germany looking for that teenage girl and found her, married her, moved to America, and that's Marty's parents. Marty said one of the hardest and most difficult things of his childhood was that Waldman is a very common name. And people would always say when they knew his last name was Waldman, they'd say, oh, are you related to these Waldmans? And Marty always had to say, no, I'm not related to anyone. Because all of his uncles and aunts, his grandparents all died in the Holocaust. A few years ago, Marty went back to Auschwitz for the first time to see where his family had died. But he asked someone to go with him. Marty, being the grandson of Holocaust victims, had met a man who was a believer, who was the grandson of an Auschwitz prison guard. And they stood in Auschwitz, and the, pris the grandson of the prison camp guard prayed for the Jewish people, and Marty prayed for the German people. And I said to him when he told me this, Marty, how could you forgive the German people for what they did to your family? And he just smiled and said, because Jesus forgave me. We have been forgiven and we have to forgive. We have to release other people from the wrongs that they've done against us. And we've all had wrongs done against us all of us. But it's Satan's trick. Satan wants to keep us in bondage to that unforgiveness and that bitterness. And here's the reason. So he can keep us from ful fulfilling the destiny that God has on our lives. So I want to encourage you, please, you've heard the word today. Right now, forgive. Release forgiveness to every person that has ever wronged you. Because if we don't pass the pardon test, we can't step into the destiny that God has for our lives. I want to encourage you. All right, we're continuing our series from dream to destiny. I want you to turn to two passages of scripture, Genesis 39. This is the story of Joseph, part of the story of Joseph. It's about Genesis 37 to about Genesis 47, I believe. Uh, and so you could read that during this series. But um, Genesis 39, open your Bibles, and then put a marker at Hebrews chapter 3. And later in the message, we'll turn over to Hebrews chapter 3. So Genesis 39, Hebrews 3. Here's what the Lord showed me through this series. Every person in the world, every person has a dream from God, a, a dream that God has for your life. And every person has a destiny from God, a destiny that God wants you to fulfill. But many, many people do not fulfill the destiny God has on their life because of one word. That word is character. Their character will not support their destiny. And so God takes us through some character building tests on this earth. And what we're doing is we're looking at the life of Joseph and seeing 10 character tests that he went through so that he could fulfill the destiny God had on his life. So this week is the palace test. Pride test, pit test, palace test. By the way, the next week is the purity test, then the prison test. Yes, they all begin with P because I am gifted. So <laughs> this is the palace test. Genesis 39 verse 1. Now Joseph, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, they both begin with P, by the way, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, 
bought him from the Ishmaelites. Now, we know they were Midianite traders. Midian was the region they were from. Ishmael was the descendant they were from. From the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Now, watch verse 2 carefully. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. I hope you see the connection between those two phrases. The Lord was with Joseph him and he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian and his master saw that the Lord was with him remember his master was an unbeliever saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand so Joseph found favor in his sight and served him then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. I liken myself to Joseph in the Bible. <laughs> I think the reason it says that last phrase is because it's about to go into the purity test, how Potiphar's wife pursued Joseph, so it's telling us he was a handsome person. And so next week, by the way, is the purity test. You don't want to miss that. All right, here's what this talks about. It's an amazing statement. By the way, he's in, in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar makes him second in command. And he, he just gives him everything. He says, just run the whole thing. And then he, he winds up in prison. The keeper of the prison does the same thing. By the way, then he winds up back in the palace with Pharaoh. And Pharaoh does the same thing. But look down at the end of that chapter, chapter 39, verse 23. This is when he was in prison. It says, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. I have a very simple question for you. Would that be okay with you? Whatever you do, the Lord makes it prosper. Well, I, I feel like the Lord has given me four simple keys to being successful, to being prosperous, to being promoted in everything that we do, our job, our health, our finances, our family, our marriage, to be successful in whatever that God's called us to do, whatever we put our hand to. So here are the four keys, all right? Here's number one. I want you to write these down. Number one, the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. The key to prospering is the presence of of the Lord. Write that down. It's very important. And notice how, how many times it said the Lord was with him, so he prospered. Now, the first thing we need to talk about here is that the word prosperity is not a bad word. I know that there is a hyper prosperity teaching. I do not agree with it. I know that it's wrong. I know you cannot support it by Scripture. I understand that. But the problem is that the rest of us now have heard the hyper-teaching, and we've even pulled back from the biblical understanding of the word prospering. God wants to prosper you, to make you successful in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your health, in your job, in your career, in your finances. He wants to prosper you so you can prosper others. He wants to bless you so you can be a blessing to other people. And prosperity is not a bad word. It's all through Scripture. As a matter of fact, the word prosperity in the Hebrew means to push forward. It literally means to push forward. It's used one time, 63 times in the Old Testament. One of the times, it's when Samson, when the Spirit of the Lord came on Samson and he defeated his enemies. In other words, God came on Samson and pushed him forward. Now, again, I want to ask you, would that be all right with you? Would it be all right if in your job, in your career, in your family, God was always, but Lord, but God, but God just pushing you forward. Well, the key to prospering is the presence 
of the Lord. And let me tell you why. Because God never fails. God's never failed in anything he's done. So if we walk with the presence of the Lord, if we walk with God, we're going to prosper. Because God's going to prosper. Find out what God's doing and get in on it. Wherever God's going, and here's the problem. People go out from the presence of the Lord. You know, it's not that God removes his presence. It's that we walk away from the Lord. It says, the Bible says, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. God came to Adam, gave him a chance to repent. He came to Eve, gave her a chance to repent. He came to Cain. Cain and gave him a chance to repent. And Cain would not repent. And so Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Because God was walking one way and Cain decided to walk another way. When you walk with God, you're successful. When you don't walk with God, you're not successful. So let me show you a few scriptures. You can stay right there in Genesis 39. Genesis 26 verses 12 and 13. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. 
and the Lord blessed him. Now watch and see if God shies away from using the word prosperity just because of the hyper-prosperity teachers. Verse 13, the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. It looks like it's in the Bible. Deuteronomy 29, verse 9, Therefore keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. 2 Kings 18, 7, The Lord was with him, he prospered wherever he went. And 3 John, verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. I want you to know that God would like to push you forward in your career, push you forward in your family, push you forward in all that you put your hand to. But the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. Even an unbeliever, Potiphar, recognized that the Lord was with Joseph and that his house, Potiphar's house, was blessed because the Lord is with him. Here's a good question. Does your employer, whether he's a believer or an unbeliever, does your employer believe that he's being blessed because you work for his company? That's what happened with Joseph. So the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. So you might say, well, what's the key to the presence of the Lord then? If, that, if that's it, I want to prosper. Well, so what's the key to the presence of the Lord? Well, I'm ahead of you. I've got it all figured out here, all right? The key to the presence, here's number two. The key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. The key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. Let me read you some scriptures. Second Chronicles 17, verse 3. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because, here's why he was with him. Because he walked in the former ways of his father David, he did not seek the bells. In other words, because he obeyed. He walked in obedience. 1 Samuel 18, verse 14. And David behaved. We could stop right there. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Now, we know that David didn't do everything right. We know that. It's in the Bible. But when he did mess up, he repented. He came back to the Lord. He humbled himself. When, his, when, when the prophet came to him, he humbled himself. And he came back. 1 Samuel 18, verse 12. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Here's a very, very simple couple of questions. Why was the Lord with David? Because he obeyed. And why had the Lord departed from Saul? Because he disobeyed. Let me show you another scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 28. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Now here's God saying, I'm going to let you choose. A blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Listen to me carefully. This is not a works doctrine. We are saved by grace through faith. We go to heaven by grace. But if you want to succeed on this earth, you're going to have to obey. If you obey and walk with God, you will walk in success. Doesn't mean everything will go right for you. Doesn't mean you'll never go through a storm. But it means God will take you through those storms successfully. Let me read you another scripture. Job 36, verses 11, 12. If they obey and serve God, him, God, capital H, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they do not obey, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen: he who covers his sins, in other words, walks in disobedience, will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them, turns from them, will have mercy. You know that I believe in grace. I believe so strongly in grace that we're saved by grace. If, it, if it's based on works, you've already lost it. You're already in trouble. Let me just assure you of that. 
Grace is a gift. If it's, if it's a gift, it can't be earned. I believe in grace. But I also believe in obedience. And I have seen that when I walk with God in obedience, I'm blessed. Everything I put my hand to is blessed. And when I walk away from God, there's a curse. Now listen to me. It's not God cursing me. It's like we live in a curse. It's not like. We live in a cursed world. We live in a cursed world. It's like, this is what I was going to say, we, there's a hail storm going on around us with huge chunks of hail about that big falling all over the place. And there is this steel umbrella over God and whoever walks with him. So we walk with God and this thing protects us. We are protected and blessed and covered. But when we choose to walk away from God, we choose to walk out there in this hell storm and hope we can dodge him. But we're not going to be able to dodge him. So the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. The key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. Now, here's what some of you are thinking. Well, I just don't obey. I'd like to obey, but I just don't obey, and I just don't, I just, so, Pastor Robert, I'm going to need the key to obedience. I got that covered. <laughs> the key to obedience, here's point number three. The key to obedience is faith. The key to obedience is faith. Do you know why a farmer plants? Because he believes that he's going to receive a reward. Listen, many of us have more faith in the hot water heater than we do in God. Because what happens when you turn the hot water faucet on? It's not hot. It's cold. And we just stand there. <laughs> waiting, right? I lived in one house. The house I lived in before I lived in now, they located the hot water three houses down. The hot water heater. <laughs> I could turn the hot water on and go write a sermon and come back. Still not be hot. But what we just said, you know why? We know. We know we turn that faucet on. It may feel cold. It's going to get hot. Listen to me. You turn the faucet of obedience on, it may feel cold. It's going to get hot. It's going to. Because you, you, you just, you, you got to believe. And here's the problem. We, we don't believe that there are rewards if we obey and there are consequences if we disobey. If we believed that, we would obey. But many times we feel like we can disobey and get away with it. You don't get away with it. The reason children obey is because they believe they'll be rewarded if they obey, and they believe they'll, be, uh, they'll suffer consequences if they don't. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise or with a reward that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. I've asked people before and somehow they forget part of it. I'll say, what's the, what's the promise if you obey or honor your mother and father? They say that you may live long. That's only part of it. The promise is that things may go well with you. And I don't even know if you want to live long if things aren't going well. <laughs> That things may go well, there's a reward. And if children believe that they'll be rewarded if they obey, and if they believe there are consequences, and Proverbs tells us those consequences are spankings, if they believe that if they disobey, there's a consequence, they will obey. Let me read you another scripture on this. Colossians 3, verses 22 through 25. Bond servants obey. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Now, turn to Hebrews 3. I'm taking a little more time on this point because I think it's so important. Because all of us want to obey. We want to do the right thing. But how do you obey? Well, you obey if you have faith. So, in Hebrews chapter 3, when I saw this scripture, I thought, that's it. That's it right there. As a matter of fact, I thought of this scripture when God gave me this point. Hebrews 3, verse, verses 18 and 19. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest. This is the reward of the promised land. Who would not receive the reward of the promised land? 
but to those who did not obey. Now watch this carefully. Verse 19 says, so we see that they could not enter in because of, watch, unbelief. What, where did that word come from? He was talking about obeying. You would think it would say, those who did not obey could not receive the reward. So we see they could not receive it because they did not obey. No, it says because they did not believe, because of unbelief. Listen to me, faith produces obedience. If they had believed that God would reward them, then they would have obeyed. They disobeyed because they didn't believe. So the key to prospering is the presence of the Lord. Because if you're walking with God, God always succeeds. The key to the presence of the Lord is obedience. The key to obedience is faith. So, some of you are thinking, well, what's the key to faith? Well, this is the most practical one of all, and it's simple. And listen to me, all of you can do it. Everyone here can do it. You'll choose whether you want to, you'll choose whether you want to prosper. It won't be me, it won't be anyone else, it won't be your boss, it won't be anyone. You have no excuse for not prospering. You'll choose whether you want to prosper, whether you want the presence of God, to walk with the presence of God, whether you're going to obey, whether you're going to have faith, because this right here is something you can do. I promise you, everyone can do it. The key, here's point number four, the key to faith is hearing the word. The key to faith is hearing the word. Now listen to me. You might think I'd say doing the word. I believe in obedience. I've already talked about that. But that's not what produces faith according to the Bible. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Faith comes by hearing the word. Listen to me. You want to have faith? Hear the word. Listen to as many sermons as you can. Uh, download them. Get the iPod. Listen to CDs uh, of sermons, of sermons that preach the word, that teach the word. Not just the guys give you five points for better health and all that stuff. But the ones that really preach and teach the word. Get in the word of God. Read the word yourself. Memorize the word of God. Put it on your iPhone. When you have a few minutes, read it. Put it on note cards. Put it on your mirror. You know, obviously where you can still see what's behind you. Kind of to the side. But... Memorize it, meditate on it, study it, get the word in you. Here's why the Bible says hearing the word builds faith in you. Listen very carefully because the word has the power to change your life. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and his name is the word of God. And the word of God is, corrupt, is not a corruptible seed but incorruptible seed which lives and abides forever. And heaven and earth will pass away but his word never will. And his word will never return void without accomplishing what he sent it to do. Learn the word of God. Know the word of God. I'm, I'm telling you, I don't, know, I don't know how to impress upon you to spend time with the Word, to get to know the Word. Now, I want you to even think about these last three points, all right? I talked about prospering in the presence of the Lord, but obeying, having faith, or believing, and, and hearing the Word. And that's what I'm telling you. It's very simple. You can prosper. You can prosper because you're walking with God. You're going to walk with God because you obey. You obey because you believe. 